And now we give this time to Reverend Koo. Good morning. Thank you for joining us both on the site as well as online. Jeff, I want to thank you for that song and uh, just recall at such a time that when that song was sung when I was in my first Bible school in the United States. And I remember at the time there was one of my classmates, his name, um, I don't quite remember, but we know his nickname. He was known as the Elvis Presley of Korea. And when he sang, now you have to imagine a little bit, uh, sometimes the two of us sang and two of us Asians singing this song, both really very moved by it as well as a Southern train. But it's indeed the goodness of God is what leads us. And what the psalmist said in Psalm 23, 6, there's much depth for us to plumb from that particular verse. Psalm 23, all of us know very well. But at the same time, we also have to consider the journey through which experiencing the goodness of God and how we will grow in the goodness of God that's embedded through the Holy Spirit in us. Now, of course, goodness, we have to give a bit of definition to begin with. It's always a good practice because today we can have terms people throw around. In fact, recently I have some very good discussion with different people. Now, as, as you know, I also work in the court system, and you have to be very precise about terminology. In fact, often it is the misuse of terms or people, words would be people who do not understand the term and think that's what the word means and if something is totally different and sometimes they can make a major, major decisional mistake. For example, as simple as the judge, uh, if the counsel would say objection, the judge will see either say overrule or sustain. Now you get it wrong, and that would be a very kind of um, laughable kind of consequences or our sequence for the matter. So precision of the language is very important. Now, precision of the language as, is as important as the precision on the GPS. This morning coming down here, let me just show you a bit of God's goodness. Maybe I should give you a definition first and then tell you the story, okay? Goodness, for example, is that talk about something that's beautiful and good looking. But it's more than the surface of our word, but it's also always conveyed in the Bible. It's a moral, ethical goodness and character. Uh, it's Nelson, if there's a slide, we can go to that. Thank you. Uh, we can go to this next slide, please. Now, naturally, what it is, is talk about something that's inside of you that come out naturally. Therefore, there is a coherence or integrity involved that you can never be one thing inside and betray and portray something else totally different on the outside. Now, so in short, cosmetic, or you try to cover up, is not going to work very well. Now, the goodness of God is as such this morning. Let me come back to that story. And uh, we are very excited today uh, for what's going to happen this afternoon or the nation of uh, Elder uh, uh, Tim Kwok to become the senior pastor of this church. We have everything ready. And we went, we drove until we hit New Jersey, about to enter I-95. And all of a sudden say, where is the rope I'm supposed to wear? Good. Oh, no. Now it's no time to turn back. We cannot. And now what are we going to do? Well, the goodness of God is as such that after a bit of deliberation, what we might, my wife had upon the idea, say, wait a minute. There was, she had a childhood friend who's also a pastor and it's actually not far from Freehold. So she contacted him. Happened so he's at home today. He's on vacation. He's able to actually uh, loan me his rope. Now, in a way that, now why the rope is so important? Because it really 
other than ceremony, ceremonial thing, is also represent the importance of this event for this church as well as to the candidate. I don't want to have any way to misconstrue that that's not important. It is very important and also very humbling for me to be on this ordination council. Now, let me work you through the goodness and the principle of growth. Now, as a Christian, the best way I can help understand is that as a Christian, it's not just something if you have a religion and just do good. I think far too many people kind of stuck in that. We are comfortable with religion. But Christian faith is never so much a religion as a living relationship. Now, so what does that mean is that God, whom we born again in Christ Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit, then because of the infusion of his power to break the habit of sin, that we are able to grow the fruit that is truly authentic fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is to say, before we come to Jesus, this is not part of our nature. Some of us may be morally good and upright, but you'll never be the kind of power or clarity as God when he works in and through you. Now, make no mistake, we'll never be what we what God designed us to be without being in him. All right? So now, when God is going to give us the growth, we have to understand that two levels or attributes that God has. The first is what you call in untransferable. That is to say, those are characteristics uniquely God, eternal, powerful, everlasting. All those are his. That is no, he will not transfer that. But that which is transferable is that what he intends us to become. And for example, what it says here in the Holy, in the fruit of the Spirit, patience, joy, goodness, mercy, and so on. All those are God's very characteristics that he would want his children to have is fully capable of grow into that. So that's why we are being called ambassador of Christ and we have the authority of Jesus. Remember when Jesus sent out his disciples, he gave him authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. And then when he was leaving the earth, he also said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. I therefore send you to make disciples of all nations. Now, therefore, the authority is not for us to declare ourselves. That authority is we understand we operate under and the royal, literal, the royalty and the nobility of that. Now, Let's also understand something. God's goodness is his very nature. That is to say, you cannot detach them from him. Now, the Psalm 25, 8 and Matthew 19, 8. Uh, next slide, please. God's goodness is his nature. And it, the psalmist said it's a study and show and see the goodness of God. Nehemiah 9.35 says, it is great. Remember the context of Nehemiah. They're coming back to the land of the ancestors that was cast out because of the idolatry. In Romans 2.4, in the midst of talking about human rebellion, and the apostle said, Apostle Paul said, the riches of the goodness of God. Exodus 34, 6 talks about it is abundant. God is slow to anger. He's very gracious. And Jeremiah, another prophet from the uh, exilic and also the great uh, uh, prophetic period, he also said the goodness of God is the one who turns your sorrow into joy. And so what we can see is the goodness of God is never just if God is on his whim, if you get on his good side, but his very nature that's enduring is out of his love that he will not hurt you. And most importantly, there is no agenda of fake goodness. That is to say, 
God will never lure you into something and then trap you. Okay, and that's the purity of the goodness and the nature of God. But what condition does it take for that to transfer to come to us? Next slide, please. The condition for transfer is first of all, we must be in Him. We must be in Him that God is the source of that. More so, we must be willing to receive. Now, God is willing to give, and how God gives is He wants to have us make that choice ourselves, and He wants to transfer. It's a full package. Uh, the probably this is not a, the best of illustration I can think of, but think about your computer that needs a new software system to operate. Right? Sometimes it happens. What well, doesn't matter what brand you use. And can you imagine you download only part of the package, and then you try to run your computer? Sometimes it runs, but most of the time it will not because there's some missing file, missing update, or some feature. Well, who is to blame? Well, either your hard drive is not big enough, or you make a mistake. But no developer would actually give you an incomplete package. Let alone God. God always wants us to take on His full expression of transferable attributes. Okay, so what that means that always we have that room to grow. But so let's take a look at how the goodness of God is manifested. First of all, is that it is a everlasting love. That is, he does not change his mind. He always is. He also manifests his love to his church. Take a look at what happened in Acts 13, that he had blessed the church of Antioch that have two, if you will, star pastors, namely Paul and Barnabas. And the Holy Spirit bring the whole church together, and they pray and they send these two out, the brightest, the best, if you will, to be missionary to the frontier. Now, the goodness of God is this. God never take away, never install, never promote by leaving a vacuum. God always does things in pulling as well as putting people in places. I must say this, in a, being a pastor for 30 years at least, um, you never fully prepare what you are doing, even every Sunday. You never fully have a de well developed sermon so well that you don't need extra work, extra thinking. Now, what does that mean? That we understand we are a work in progress. Now, the goodness of God also manifests in the way how to do good and also in supplying the needs that we have. And in turn, we provide for the need for the poor. There are, Jesus said, right? He said, the poor you always have is that you don't always have me. Now, that's why there's a saying that when you see the face of the poor, you see the face of God. Now, we're not talking about people pretending to be poor. We're talking about people who truly are poor, who truly don't have the means, don't have the ability to take care of themselves or maybe even get a decent meal. And also God's goodness, it manifests in forgiving our sins that lead us to repentance. And literally, that goodness is from the bottom of his heart that is a lifestyle also of the righteous person. And so that is good, isn't it? We all want that goodness. Do we have that goodness? Well, let's also take a look at what obstacles would be for us to resist the goodness of God. Now, first of all, I want to talk about the enemy from within. Now, when you look at the Galatians passage, you always see this. It's that of the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, when you go back to verse 19 to 21, he listed all of them. If you want to be a good Bible study student, this is what you do. 
exactly find out number one what the definition each word is and number two when you need to grow this one thing what are the enemies or what are the things that can kind of stop you cold or try to resist now i have seen uh there are people who believe this way if god is good then god need to do everything for me and then some other people who also believe, well, they are so good that God has to use them, that they are God's gifts to the church. And I remember seeing this one young man in one of my ministry. The guy is a Casanova, is a womanizer. Somehow he believed he's God's gift to women. And he go around and try to break up couples already dating, and he became the enemy of every single guy in that church. Now, that is nothing holy about it. There's only a lust that run rampant, but somehow the problem is the nemesis is to believe somehow we are so special favor. We credit ourselves and literally to the point and say, I can make God look good. I actually have some people say that to me. I cannot believe it. That's what they say. You know, pastor, I can make God look good. They really don't know the theology. And I said to them and say, you know what? God look much, look much better without you. <laughs> and also people who distort the truth to put themselves in a more prominent setting. And sometimes they twist things. Sometimes they merge things. Sometimes they detach things. And ending up accepting worship and generate a falsehood. And then they embezzle God's goodness and rob God's gifts to fed oneself. Now notice, all this nemesis from within is we are choosing to harden our hearts and usually means the person has no accountability and hypocrisy is usually already in existence. Now, the Word of God does warn. If a person been warned many times without repenting, that person may, and God may, and will suddenly destroy it, that person. And I have seen it. And I will say this, not a British say. Other than ourselves being the problem, we also have the nemesis, the enemies from outside. So have we asked the question, what company are we keeping? Some of us believe we are very good with people, that we are a crowd pleaser, or we get together, we are the soul of the party, so to speak. But what is our core value? Is it myself or is it God? When we seek direction, do we discern what other people are telling us or what is their true intention? Or do we actually apply for their approval. You see, when we know the truth of God, when we know His standard, we have only one thing in mind. is His, what we receive from Him, we live, we can give. If we resist, they would not grow in us, and then we would not be able to pass on those merciful goodness. So, Let's talk about how do we live in God's goodness, living in God's goodness. Next slide, please. Now, we must remember the following. The Bible says clearly, it is in God's goodness that we are not consumed. Consume here means literally into the hellfire. If we look at this, uh, Revelation chapter 21, and that was a frightening scene. Talk about the lake of fire, that all the evil and the evil one will be thrown in there, and that is fire that will not, that will not go away. That will be eternal torment. You know what the Bible says? That's what we should be, but we're not because God does not desire us to be destroyed. We are created His image. And God also causes the rain and sunshine to the, both the good and the evil. Now, why does God do that? I wonder, honestly, if God is saying, okay, 
Let me just have sunshine today. It's sunny out here today in Jersey. Let me just have sunshine today only for those people who are good according to my standard. I wonder how dark our area would become. And I think the real surprise would be some would believe we are really pretty good and all sun and say, wow, there's no sun around us. Now, what would that do? I think that can be wake up call. Now, but just because God is having such mercy to us, we should not take his mercy for granted. Now, why? Because he gave us that knowledge of him for us to live his goodness. Now, John 7, 17 is a powerful verse. Jesus said, if a man wills to do his will, he shall know the doctrine whether I speak of myself or my father has spoken. Now here the word will is talking about a verb as well as somewhat like a noun. That is to say we have to make a decision to follow God. Now this is the amazing part that I want you to get. If you're a person and we have known people, all the years you've been in churches, you do not quite understand the truth. You presume the truth, but sometimes you don't get certain things. And I want you to really think this one through. Is that possible? You know the framework of theology, but you're never willing to submit. How is that possible? Some people know God's calling to them so clearly they're willing to follow. But why are you so fearful, lacking this or lacking that? Now, chances are because we have a head knowledge it was never so much a will to obey the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying here is this. The goodness of God is a real life application always. God is not interested in giving us the final point of theology. God is concerned about us incarnational presence. You see, with receiving, then we can give. And also, don't try to set upper and lower limit where we will and we will not be. I think this uh, this season of pandemics have, have a lot of people break some tradition. Recently, somebody sent me uh, one of those videos. This person in Singapore, he was a conductor of some opera. Now, you know, that is a very classic and you need a lot of training to do that. And what is this person doing? Well, as we all know, nobody is going to watch opera in the opera house. And a lot of pre-recorded program can substitute for the lost patronage. What this person ended up doing, he was actually doing something, uh, food delivery, riding a bike or something. Now, that's reality, isn't it? I mean, certain aspects, for example, if you're a high-flying career in the airline industry right now, unless you the phrase that to you'll be busy, but other than that, you will not be very busy. So there's a lot of change. Does it mean the goodness of God is not there? Would the goodness of God simply say once the pandemic is over? Now let's be careful about this. Let's not try to set that condition to say, now God, if you do this, this, and this, then you're good. But if you don't do it, you're not. That's no way to talk to God. Okay? There's no way for us to really have that. Because if that's the case, God is not God anymore. God become our servant. We have become God. And that's a real danger. In, but we need to leave that also to learn less judgmental, more grace. And also, just because circumstance change, our God does not. Now, but chances are, some of us actually know, but... There's a warning. Next slide, please. There's a warning against the complacent and the indifferent. I have been talking to a lot of pastors in the last year. We all come to this one conclusion that's troubling. Is this pandemic is revealing a lot about the people whom we have been leading. We thank God for those who are growing and who through the pandemic, they take the next few steps and really see some great works that God has been doing. But also at the same time, we are troubled by the fact that there are those who have been wasting 
God's goodness. There are those who do not participate, those who do not engage. You see, when the goodness of God is there, and that doesn't mean God withdraw, He's always there. We need to be sensing Him. We are we building God's kingdom, our own empire. Are we doing stuff that inflict pains and damages to others? In the book of Revelation, we have to bear this in mind. Because the book of Revelation speaks of towards the end time when you have the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Now, three times in that narrative, it says this. Despite all this hardship humankind are going through, mankind in general are cursing God, will not repent, and they're demanding God. Now, strange, we want to tell God, remove it. Now, we, to some extent, that means we admit God can use pandemic as his weapon, earthquake. God already said that all these things are his disposal. But do we understand the intention of God? God's intention is this. Before you breathe your last, turn to me. Don't try to believe you have another day. Turn to me now. We cannot afford to be complacent and to be indifferent because God, he's patient but there's a limited time that we can respond to him. More so, do not, do not, do not lie against the truth. If somebody does it, it will be a very bad gamble because it's a guarantee you lose. So given all the warning, the definition, let's take a look at some biblical example of God's goodness, shall we? Now, what we already said, uh, the goodness God had given, sun, rain, and so on. Just think about that. Too much of it is a problem. Too little is a problem. We remember Ahab's time. God withhold rain for three and a half years to bring people back to him. Now, let's also take a look at the moral goodness that's prevalent in those whom have been chosen by God. One of the powerful verses in the Bible, Genesis 50, 20. Now we know all the we all know the story of Joseph, but let me correct some view that I have often heard and reiterate so many times from different pulpits. A lot of us like to believe Joseph is a tattletale. This guy just kind of showing off his colorful coat and try to taunt his brother. I have it. Do you have it, daddy? Da, da, da. It seems we do that a lot to add to his character. Let me say this. I believe that is a totally wrong representation and a bad reading of the scripture. And let me tell you why. Now, this is actually your Bible study method. I had to do it right. Why? Remember, there was something. Number one, he has the dream, right? He dreamed twice about all the sun and stars and the stalks about to him. They call him a dreamer. And also is when his brother, older brother, had 10 of them, they were going out to, um, to have the, uh, the, the flock grazing elsewhere. And the older brother, some of them, they were doing things that is not exactly pleasing to their parents. Now, that is to say, even within a Christian family, I do not expect many times all the children are in good obedience and compliance to the moral standard that they know they should have. In fact, the scripture, spare no word, you go ahead, read it, said the evil deeds. The evil deeds in that context is actually involve certain sexual inner windows as well as kind of liaison with local women prostitutes. Now, so in a way, Joseph, he is not telling his brother. He is telling the truth. Should he have kept his mouth shut? Now, you have to understand something. Because that be, does not become evident until Potiphar's wife, who seek to seduce him and he refused. When he said, how can I do such a great e evil against God and against your husband? who put me in charge of this household except you. Now, so we have to understand Joseph 
in that environment, his brother was less than honorable out there. In fact, in later on, we realized that Reuben, one of the brother, actually slept with his, uh, it should be saying, uh, his father's wife. I mean, that's really messy. Okay, so Joseph, he did not had to tell to get the anger of the brother. But what you have seen is actually the brother who is so sick and tired of somebody who have moral underpinning. They say, let's get rid of him, let's kill him. You, so you have to understand, by the time the brother come up with this idea, you see what happened with when you go from one evil to the next, perhaps who, I don't know how they get started, but this is one thing of the slippery slope of sin. Now, this also raises a bit of a mystery, is this. How in the world, in a the family, they all grew up in the same set of parents, how come some turn out to be so good and so bad? Well, that's a mystery. As parents, you know it, right? So in a way, we we're grateful for those who follow the Word of God, but also sad those who have departed the truth of God. But remember this, prodigal always starts from home. And prodigal will always come home. The question is, we cannot control the path. However, the goodness of God is this. Goodness of God is he will lead them. He will lead them home if they're willing. You see, Joseph, see this. By the time he spoke to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20, he said, you meant for evil, but God meant for good. You know what he's able to see? God, who had the big picture, he had to wait nearly 20 years for the dreams of his, uh, the bowing from the sun and the moon and the stars and the stock to truly be fulfilled. More so, his goodness is this. He turned his father's brother's anxiety and the guilt into faith. Now, let's think about the personal and corporate application, shall we? Now, in Matthew 5, 48, he said we should model after the goodness of God. And remember also, the church is a corporate body of believers. Therefore, we have the duty to hold another accountable. And discipline is part to say you belong to the family. Now, discipline also is part of that goodness. And also, it's important on the pilgrimage of faith, we have the goodness of God through companions who travel together. So we don't have to, uh, have got, we, we don't have to really try to fake it till we make it. No, we don't have to do that at all. But we, our lives should mirror good, the goodness of God. And when you also think about another uh, verse, of course, is a verse we have this morning, Psalm 23, 6. You realize uh, even people who don't come to church, people who don't know the Lord, many of them, I especially when I conduct funerals, people ask, hey, can you uh, cite that? Can you read that for us? Now, uh, when the summer says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord, he's talking about his experience with God in all circumstances. In those difficult times, in the good times, in the quiet time or tumultuous time. That is, even when he was led forth into the wilderness, the enemy have done so. Remember, David read through his Psalms and he was saying even, oh, it is you whom I fought with friends who actually who were eating with me and then kicked me at the same time. Now, Psalmist is not telling us try not to believe in people, be skeptical of all, but he's saying this, the confidence that you and I can have is in God and God alone. And many times it's that when we allow, God allow us to go through those wilderness experience, those experiences may not start at the parent imitation of God. Sometimes it's our enemy 
who get the invitation, who push us like Elijah, Elijah, and many others like, of course, and Moses did it himself. Elijah was actually forced there by Jezebel, but God's hand is behind it because God is bringing Elijah into the wilderness to experience His goodness. In that goodness, God did not condemn him. In that goodness, God never rebuked him to call him a useless person. And God did not say, what am I going to do? This is my last prophet. No, God said, I reserve myself 7,000 people. Elijah, in case you want company, you got them. See, when God take us through that, we are his honor guests in that table for one. Your enemy had no part. Your enemy, even though they were near, they're not invited. That banquet of fullness to experience is also mean to expand our understanding of God's power, protection, even through our tears, to look into our hearts and life, what our bottom line core value God seeks to uh, to heal, to restore, and to correct. So we learn how to rest through yielding. So let me conclude Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. We know this verse very well. It says, forgetting what lies behind, striving to what's ahead. Notice the Apostle Paul used both a present continuous tense, forgetting. Now, forgetting doesn't mean you erase, it become blank. Forgetting is you do not react, you do not respond, you do not same think the same way like when it happened. I think you can always point to those experiences of our own injuries. Sometimes we cause it ourselves, sometimes other people, for whatever reason, they decide to inflict it. But you see, if we are so driven by just wanting to get even and you're so consumed by it, you become like those who inflict the pain. But forgetting is to really is a deliberate act of saying, you know, because I have the direction I am moving to. Why can I move forward? Because I have a new identity in Christ Jesus. Our past is no longer what defines us. Sometimes people, for the longest time, they don't remember the good we do. They remember the evil or maybe the naughtiness that we are. That's human nature, isn't it? But think about that is we learn even through those. And also when we look at another person, do we able to see striving to what's ahead not running away from your past, but the new path that you forge in the goodness of God, that He can change all things. The growth ahead starts now. So, some question we have to really reflect upon the goodness of God. First, God never intend to give us all the goodness that we fed ourselves and we become the center and just sit with it. God's point isn't so much information, but always transformation. That is, when we so receive, let our heart be changed, let our mind be changed, let this whole person being the new creation in Jesus. Your value is different. Your value is totally different. And then you go from there and say, how can I use this one God has given me to bless others? And more so, you identify with someone whom you can see you are exactly like me when I was in that stage. You see, it does take one to know one. It does take one who had been there to understand that what had been. Last night, I uh, linked back up with one of my cousins. We have not talked for about seven to eight years. And man, once we start talking... It's amazing. We spent almost two hours. And she said, you know, you're preaching tomorrow. I better cut now. It's almost midnight by the time I'm out time. But one thing that we both have similar is we have cancer. And, you know, it's amazing. 
when you share those experiences, even though I don't have to go for chemo, she does. And you can hear the other person basically saying, I understand where you are because I have been there. You see, brothers and sisters, friends, in order for the goodness of God to truly live through us, we have to abandon this external pretentious. Don't bother with that because nobody will be impressed. We only impress ourselves. That's no good because that's deception. The goodness of God, however, in Romans talk about from him, through him, to him are all things that you say. God come through us, transform us so that his mercy, his love, and his word and his spirit can through us minister to people in need. More so because we work, we walk in the spirit of God, we can discern the people whom God directed us to. You'll find the goodness of God to some is speak the truth, even in confrontation. You'll find others that you speak the truth <clears throat> by really guiding them. You'll find many times in the process, we are being blessed when there are other people whom also bless us in return. And I pray today that we take and grow the goodnesses of God. If you identify any nemesis already in the persistent, let somebody know. Break it by through praying, maybe fasting even, and also watch out for nemesis. Who is influencing you? What are those concepts that have been in you that is not true goodness of God, but potentially try to make you God in contrast to what God's design. So I pray, let the goodness shine before men. As the good testimony, people will know you belong to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you. We know we do not grow this by ourselves. We're never able to do so because we're able. But you are, and you're the one who moves us forward in the most powerful way. Forgive us, Father, for times we often go back to our old ways. And I pray especially for some who are struggling. Perhaps even they tie so much their identity or design position or desire to be recognized for certain thing, but they know it is, number one, not the right thing, and number two, just really faking it. And I pray that they will humble themselves and view and confess because your goodness, because your goodness, we are not consumed. But you also have warned us, you only give us so much opportunity, not that you lost patience, but there's a time when your hand, you act. So let us be wise and let us indeed live the goodness for the purity of hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.